so when we proclaim the name of Jesus, power is free. Welcome to New Dawn Community Church, the message of the week with Pastor Randall Cutter. So today we are jumping back into the book of Luke chapter 12, and we are today going to have Jesus focusing his perspective on how we view material possessions. He is going to attempt to shift the view of his disciples. We are his disciples. He is going to attempt to shift our view also in this time in Luke chapter 12. I have a little video clip that reminds us how we view material possessions. Ready? You spend your working life taking care of your number. Retire and it can take care of you. With help from ING, you can use your number to get steady income in retirement. Do you know your number? Learn more at ingyournumber.com. Okay, ING has that. Remember that commercial, right? Where everyone would be walking around with their number and some of them were really big numbers and some of them were small numbers. And it puts so much insecurity into the people that watch you that don't have any numbers. And the message is, as you see the guy jumping into the pool or the guy on the airline or the guy, the message is, hey, work with your number so that when you retire, you can do what? Eat, drink, and be merry or enjoy life. I like the, uh, this one, which was, this was still an ING ad, but it was actually uh, mocking a guy's lack of preparation. I've cut that part out because I think it, it really is, it speaks to a big mindset in our culture. Hey Clark, what you got there? It's my number. It's the amount I need to save to retire the way I want. Is that your number? Yeah. A gazillion, huh? A gazillion. <laughs> a gazillion. Okay. <laughs> that guy, uh, this guy's carrying around a number that's like one million something into having his retirement account, but the uh, other guy had a gazillion. Now they mock his lack of planning in this thing because they're saying you got a plan. You got a plan with ING. You got to, because the guy that wanted a gazillion says, I'll just throw some money at it every now and then. Builds a huge amount of insecurity, but also communicates a mindset in our culture that most of us would be very comfortable with because we've grown up in our culture. We've grown up in a materialistic world that teaches us how to work with finances. And I have to tell you that it's not necessarily the way that Jesus looks at material possessions or at finances. So today, as we are looking at Luke chapter 12, we're starting with verse 13, and the message today is keeping the kingdom first, because that is critically important. Now, as we jump into this section of scripture, I just want to remind you of the setting in Luke chapter 12, verse 1. We read this last time. When countless thousands of people had gathered, so many that they were trampling on each other, Jesus began to speak primarily to his disciples. He said, protect yourselves from the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So, the uh, picture is Jesus is surrounded by people. They are so close, they're trampling on each other. He can't move among them, he can't heal. And so he's just got his disciples close to him. And the disciples may have been 100 people. You know, it's, it's a group of people. And so he's got them, and so he begins to primarily teach them because they were the ones that were the closest and could hear, and he couldn't move around. So he taught the ones that were closest to him, but others could hear. And Jesus says, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. And he does that thing last week where we saw him saying, hey, you can think that you can speak all this negative stuff in the inner rooms of your homes, but it's going to be shouted from the rooftops in the heavenly kingdom. And you can think you've got secrets, but the secrets are going to come out into the light. God's going to take care of this hypocrisy of the Pharisees where they presented one face to the crowds, but they were filled with hypocrisy and wickedness in every other area. And 
Jesus is making certain that the disciples understood that they needed to avoid the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Then he talks about, you know, the problem is, is one of the things you're going to be tempted to do is deny me because of the pressure they're going to bring against you. And he's talking to them about making the choice for him, even when pressure comes against them. And he's talking, he says this thing, don't be afraid of those that kill the body, but be afraid of the one that can end your life. And not only end your life, but he can send you to hell afterwards. The guys that kill your body now, they can't send you to hell. They can't do anything with you once you're dead. However, However, the Father in heaven can do, he can, he can actually deal with your eternal future. So make sure that you fear him more than the people around you. This is pretty heavy duty stuff that he's talking about. And right in the midst of this, as he's sharing primarily with his disciples, we have the verse 13 in front of us today, which is a jarring reminder of how material we can be even in the face of a discussion about eternal kingdom matters. Just a reminder before I get to the verse, this is my translation today of the Greek Bible. However, you know, I recommend you have your favorite Bible open in front of you and you'll see that Pretty much the nuances are about the same, just a little way of phrasing it. Sometimes I phrase things a little differently just so that it's it, it, it's a different way of looking at it so that it, it, it opens our mind more to what Jesus is saying. So we are in verse 13 and 14 right now of Luke chapter 12. It says, Then a person in the crowd called out to him, Teacher, tell my brother to give part of the inheritance to me. But Jesus said to him, Sir, who appointed me as judge or estate manager for you? So you've got this really intense discussion going on with Jesus and the disciples, and there's someone from the edge of the crowd says, Teacher, help my greedy side. And we know that that's what was really motivating him because Jesus addresses greed right after this. So in the midst of all of this wonderful focus on eternal matters, this guy interrupts him. I mean, he interrupts him and says, tell my brother to share or to give part of the inheritance to me. Wow. So he's interrupting the discussion on laying down your life for Christ. That's, what he's, that's the discussion. Here, you may be called upon to lay down your life for Christ, and it's worth it. Hey, teacher, this is just, just a butt in for a minute. I want you right now to put on your judge's hat or your estate manager's hat. That's what we're talking about. It was an estate judge or an estate manager. They had the same types of offices that we have when there's a, an inheritance that's at stake. Remember in their culture that there was a double inheritance for the oldest son and so more than likely the oldest son had his double inheritance but he was managing the estate and saying well we're not going to divide the inheritance yet and maybe the younger brother was so young and immature that he would have frittered it away we've got a parable about that one don't we prodigal son and so the older brother who is managing the estate realizes if i want to get rid of one third of it real quick and have it be frittered away I give it to him. That could be. I'm just developing a scenario of why the young man would not, or the man would not have his inheritance yet. And so, um, because he certainly could get it if he went to an estate manager or he went to a judge. If it was rightfully his, he could have got it, unless he wasn't yet 30 and hadn't demonstrated sufficient knowledge and wherewithal to deal with it. So this was just a guy with an inheritance issue, but he, he was coming to the wrong source. He was hoping that he could get Jesus to endorse his claims when Jesus knew nothing of the story. And so he wanted to draw Jesus into something that wasn't even his focus. So Jesus, what he does is properly directs him to the officials that are the proper officials, if we want to put it that way. He wants to, he, he says, you need to you need to take it to where, you, you know, we've got a system set up for this. Use the system. If you get trapped into something, getting involved in something that is not really your area of expertise, you can, you can well, you can muck things up. So you don't want to muck things up. Jesus would not have mucked it up. It's just that he didn't need to deal with it. So verse 15, but to his disciples, he said, 
Take care and guard yourself against all types of greed, for even when a person has an overabundance, life is not about what you own. So Jesus says to the man at the edge of the crowd, hey, go to the proper authorities. And then he looks at his disciples and he gives them an application or a teaching. He's taking advantage of this teaching opportunity, which has been thrust in front of him. He had already warned them to be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees, verses, chapter 11, verse 39. This was, this was in, you know, very close. He had already said this to them. The Lord said to him, said to, uh, well, this is the, not the warning to the disciples yet at this, but at the present, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but your insides are full of violent greed and habitual wickedness. Okay? Verse 1 is where he said, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. Here he points out what part of that yeast was. It's, you got violent greed inside of you. By the way, violent greed means they were willing to exercise fierceness to get what they wanted, to manipulate, to, to harm people, to have their greed met. And that is what he was confronting them on. So he was telling the, the disciples in this setting, be aware of the yeast of the Pharisees, and this is part of the yeast. And so he takes advantage of the opportunity to be able to, to share with them about greed because it's part of the yeast of the Pharisees. And so he makes sure that they understand exactly what is going on. So he says, take care and guard yourself against. Notice he uses two different verbs because he's very serious. He doesn't just say guard yourself. He doesn't just say take care. He says, take care and guard yourself this is very important, and it's something you have to work at. Otherwise, this will sneak up on you. That's pay special attention and put up a guard, and the implication is that this is an easy problem to slip into. So when he's speaking to his disciples, he's saying, listen, greed is a big issue. Now, we know, and so did the disciples, and so did Jesus, about the Garden of Eden. And we know, they knew better than we do, because they were in an agrarian culture, and we're not. In an agrarian culture, um, giving was always based upon the crops that came in. And so when God came to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and said, hey, that's my crop, the fruit on that tree is mine, and you give that all to me. God gave them a way to worship him, and it was by giving the entire crop of that tree to him. We don't often think of it, but more than likely, that fruit had to be harvested. And then it had to be given. And Adam and Eve chose not to give. Now, I know Eve said, do not touch it, but more than likely, she was talking about, the word touch means grasp to take. Okay, this doesn't mean just touch. So anyway, they ended up, this whole thing about greed is a big deal because the first sin was about greed. And since then, the major propensity that we have is greed. We move toward greed. The first murder was based upon greed. Abel was someone who was giving of God generously fighting the greed that had been handed down to him by his parents, and Cain was only giving some. He wasn't giving first fruits. His greed was ruling him, and his greed was a violent greed. He was greedy for God's approval also, and when he couldn't get it, he killed his brother. Greed's a bad thing. That's why Jesus says all types of greed. Because it appears in many varieties. I just pointed out one way. He was greedy for God's approval, but he wasn't willing to pay the price for God's approval, was he? He wanted to hold on to his possessions and still get the same approval that Abel got, who was truly giving first fruits and sacrificing. And that greed led him to be jealous and then to murder his brother. I don't know how he thought that was going to get him God's approval, but at that point it didn't matter. It was violent greed, he was over the top, and he was willing to do evil things. So, guard against all types of greed. The, uh, the Greek word for greed, a lot of times when the Apostle Paul uses it, it talks about sexual exploitation of others too. 
as I saw that word being used and I remembered how Paul uses it, and I know it in most, all in the, most often in the Pauline letters, it's always used in the context of sexual immorality and sexual exploitation. I, reminded, I was reminded of an article I read about what needs to happen right now up around the area that was damaged by Hurricane Michael because human traffickers will move in. Okay. Human traffickers that will be trafficking young women for sexual exploitation because of all of the influx of workers that are going to be coming into that area. They can make money on the sexual exploitation of young women. So human trafficking is a big problem after a disaster. But it's not just sexual exploitation. It's also another form of greed where they bring in undocumented workers and literally hold them as prisoners guarding them and making them work so that the employers can make, a, uh, you know, make the wages and they give those guys basically nothing and make them sleep in guarded barracks at night and everything. I mean, that's the type of thing that can happen even in the United States of America. Human trafficking is a big issue, which is why there's a big noise about it. Because when I saw that and I thought that in the aftermath of a hurricane, that type of thing can happen, that's awful. Greed shows up in many different areas, and a lot of it is violent greed, meaning it will use other people to be able to attain the end of getting more. So Jesus is warning the disciples, watch out for every type of greed. It, it can start very minor, but like any other pet sin, it grows, and it grows, and it grows. So he says, a person, even, for even when a person has an overabundance, that's talking about someone who is wealthy, an overabundance, life is not about what you own. Boy, that, tell our culture that, right? Who are, the most, who are the people in the news? It's the billionaires. It's the people that have all the money. They're the ones that seem to be the ones. You know, honestly, a lot of those people I wouldn't let teach in our Sunday school, most of them. Because they have nothing that I want. Because they have no spiritual life, no real grace. Life doesn't consist of how many toys you have or of how much money you have. And it's a poor measure, a poor indicator of the person's spiritual condition or their wisdom. When they go to the billionaires and they you know, get their advice on politics or on different... you know. This is the one that always makes me laugh. You go to someone who's very good at making money and you say, what's your opinion on global warming? They don't know. They don't know nothing. Like I said, they wouldn't know how to teach Sunday school. But they're very good at making money. Okay? But that somehow makes them an expert in all things? That's just crazy. But that's how human beings are built. Someone with a lot of money must be someone who's really... No, no, they just know how to make money. They have a grace or an anointing. There's one particular tech millionaire that's very good right now at taking all your personal information and giving it to thugs so that they can later on trouble you. If I had a billion dollars in a social network, I think that I would probably make sure I protected your information a little bit more. Don't you think that'd be like the basic thing that you do? Wouldn't that make sense? Unless you really aren't all that bright in areas other than your way of making money. Okay or it doesn't matter to you as much. So, anyway, life is not the abound, about the overabundance or the abounding of your possessions. Where wealth abounds, the temptation to measure self and others according to wealth increases. Okay, This is an application of greed, by the way. I mean, it's where wealth is there, everyone starts to measure. Why? Because then we all want that, that prestige, that power. We, that's why greed starts to build in. It's a greedy response that measures people by the amount of money that they have. And we do it all too often. I dare say most people that live in our culture would have ignored Jesus. They might have liked him for his healing, but they would have gone for him for any other wisdom. Because he did not, I mean, Jesus was not destitute. He had people supporting him. But you understand the key word. He had people supporting him. He didn't take the knowledge that he had and make millions with it. He could have. I mean, goodness, he was 
sinless. He was brilliant. His mind wasn't clouded. If he had put his mind to it, he could have used his knowledge to do some incredible things financially, but that wasn't his focus, was it? And I'm not criticizing people that do that. People are given a grace to be able to make money. That's a wonderful grace, but they have to remember that it doesn't give them more value than those that don't have that grace. That's just where they have been given grace. And other people have grace in other areas. And it, it's true wisdom to recognize that. Okay, verses 16 and 17. Jesus says, Be aware that a person's life does not consist of their overabundance of possessions. Then, verses 16 and 17, he shared a parable with them, saying, The land of a particular rich man produced an abundant harvest. So he pondered within himself, thinking, What shall I do? For I do not have a place that I can gather my harvest. So he's got a question. We all know this parable. It's a fairly familiar one. It's helpful to have a couple of keys to this parable at our disposal. Um, Right up front, we know that he's a rich man. And he already has enough, doesn't he? He's a rich man. He already has enough. That means his current barns are big enough to make him a rich man. If I were a rich man. Okay. So his barns are big enough to to, to hold what is already making him a, a, a rich, wealthy person. So we know that about him. In uh, Luke 8, 14, when we hear about riches in Luke, we hear this, remember this parable, or this story, the seed that fell among the thorns are those who have heard, and they live, as they live their lives, are choked by worries, wealth, and the pleasures of this life, and do not bear mature fruit. That, that's what can happen to us when we have wealth. When we have wealth, we can end up being choked so that mature fruit does not come out of our lives. And that is a problem. And so right away when you hear that he's a rich man, you understand one of his temptations is going to be to let his riches distract him from serving in the kingdom. This guy certainly fits that particular description very well. Okay, so he is... A rich guy. Now he's got an abundant harvest coming in, which means God is blessing the work of his hands. You understand that it's it's built into Scripture that when the harvest is good, it's because God made the harvest good. God's blessing the work of his hands. Whenever you have a big deal come in, God's blessing the work of your hands. God's giving you the ability to be able to do the work that he's called you to do. He's giving you the ability to create wealth. It's God doing that. So God's Blessing, the work of his hands, which means you got to have a question that you ask yourself, and it's the question he missed. Why has God given this to me? Why? That doesn't even enter his mind, does it? Why has God given this to me? So I can be a greedy pig. Is not the answer. Why has God given this to me? Um, you know, when you, when you think about it, even wealthy pagans. By the way, this guy's a Jewish guy. It means he's in covenant with God. So this, this story is about people in covenant with God, which means it's about us. There are two groups of people in covenant with God in Christian theology. Number one, it's the Jewish people. Number two, it's us. Right? So... This is not about Joe Pagan, but even Joe Pagan knows a little bit about this. How many hospital wings have been donated by Joe Pagan? (laughs) Universities have been endowed. People that have huge amounts of money, they say, man, I've got more money than I know what to do with. I'm going to use some of it to bless my community. Even pagans understand this. But when this greediness thing hits someone who's supposed to be in covenant with God, it kind of can make you go nuts. And you end up missing what even Joe Pagan understands. Why has God given this to me? He didn't ask that question. He says, hmm, what am I going to do? He's thinking in himself, what am I going to do? Missing the fact that God is the one who's blessed the work of his hands. So why has God given him this? And he comes up with actually, you know, the absolute wrong conclusion. Verses 18 and 19. 
Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and I will gather all my grain and my goods there. Then I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods stored up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself because you've got your number. Your gazillion has come in. Right up front, we have evidence of a poverty spirit. I'm just telling you, that's a poverty spirit. You don't need to be poor to have a poverty spirit. A poverty spirit is when you do not trust God for the future. He doesn't trust God for the future. He's like, I've got it now, and so I need to build up in case everything goes wrong. I'm, I'm not saying that people are prepping for disastrous futures are wrong in their preparation. Um, you know, when we did the millennium thing, we said, get well, in case things, the electric grid's affected at the, you know, when we were talking about the millennium bug and all that stuff, make sure that you have, you know, water filters and stuff just in case. We made sure that you had stuff. And, and our current advice is just in case there are short-term problems with the electric grid or anything, which apparently has got Congress focused on it at least now, thank God. But, the, um, but if they're short-term problems, make sure that as a Floridian, you follow the advice of our um, government in Florida, which says make sure that you have six weeks of supplies or three weeks of supplies, whatever, especially during hurricane season, just because it will get you through any negative things, okay? And uh, even then, I mean, if the people that were in Michael, right at Mexico City, had hurricane supplies, those supplies are gone, okay? Okay. But a lot of people in the peripheral would still have the ability, even though an entire county is without electricity, to be able to have at least some supplies in case the supplies don't come in. Because you understand they have to cut their way in, especially in that forested area in the, in, in the peninsula up there, or the panhandle. Uh, they, uh, you know, that, that, it, it takes a while to get all that supplies in. So uh, there's nothing wrong with preparing uh, for short-term disruptions. However, it's a poverty spirit to assume that you have to hoard, that God is not capable of providing for you if things go bad. Now, I think it's great to, to be prepared. I understand that it's good to be prepared not only for you, for your family, uh, for your neighbors, you know, whatever, in case things happen. But there's a difference between that and doing what this guy did. This guy just simply was like, well, I'm going to assume that I will absolutely have nothing in the future, and, and even if I did, it doesn't matter, I'm going to, I've got it now, and I'm going to use it. It's total self-focus. He's building bigger barns. It's just self-focus. He didn't ask, what does God give me this for? It's total self-focus. He didn't say, why is God giving me this wealth? He's ignoring wisdom and he's ignoring the kingdom of God. That's, you know, it, or kingdom good. You know, he's, why did God give me this? You know, especially in that culture, which was agrarian, his choice can impact negatively all the other farmers around him. And it was a bumper crop for him, but was it a bumper crop for them? What about the other people? I mean, there's all sorts of ways you need to analyze what was going on from an economic perspective. However, we don't need to get into that. We can just go, this guy had a poverty spirit, and that poverty spirit stopped him from saying, what is the kingdom good? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you as well. He was more concerned about his number. By the way, when Jesus tells this story, it's obvious. Um, the uh, Apocrypha, which are the bit, books that were written between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, and were well-read, well-understood. People that lived in Jesus' age read them as good spiritual material. One of the passages from the Apocrypha that everyone would have known would be this one from Sirach, chapter 11, verses 18 to 20. Someone may grow rich by working hard and denying himself pleasure, but what does he get for it? He says to himself, now I can finally sit back and enjoy what I have worked for. But he has no idea how long it will be before he must die and leave his wealth to others. Stand by your duty and stick to it. Grow old at your work. See, that's, that is the message that was going out as wisdom to the culture. And what has this guy said? I'm done working. 
I've got my number. And so because I've got mine, I've got my number, I don't need to worry about the kingdom or anything else. And all the people that lived around Jesus had been brought up on this type of wisdom. And so this guy's problem, spirit of poverty, and the I've got mine mentality. Now, the I've got mine mentality misses something. And it misses the equity that God builds in. If someone is very gifted with acquiring wealth, one of the things that the Lord has done in giving that gift is so that they're able to take the burden of the culture on at a higher level. Years ago, Don already mentioned Julian Richards today. Julian is the head of a ministry stream in Wales. He and I together traveled throughout Wales in the late 90s doing prophetic conferences. When I first came to Wales, I would do prophetic conferences. And then a team of people came up around me as we traveled. And Julian was one of them. And Julian now leads a ministry stream. And he has publicly, in his ministry stream when I've been there, um, thanked God for what I did in the 90s because of the fact that now, he says, your teaching is throughout Wales because the stuff that you taught us, we have now replicated around us. So Julian is a good friend and obviously has a lot of spiritual authority in the country. And years ago, he said this to me, and I, I had to chew on it, and I remembered it now as I was putting this together, because I, I, as I read this parable, I thought, okay, this is where it fits. And this was his quote. Now, notice I didn't put it up at the level of Scripture, because this is Julian's words. This isn't God's words. He said, when the wealthy only tithe and the poor tithe, there is injustice. Now, I might say there's not justice. And when I first heard that, I went, Huh. I, I, don't know, I mumbled about it, you know, I was like, like that. And then I realized this rich guy is an example of that. Because instead of saying, God is giving me an abundance to be able to, because what was his other option? His other option was to give it away, wasn't it? to be able to help in the culture, to be able to, to sell it and maybe build something beneficial for the whole community, a hospital wing, to whatever. Instead, he said, I'm going to keep this all to myself. And the people, the people that did not have his resources would not get the benefit of what God gave it to him. Okay, so that's, that's the picture. And I understand what Julian was trying to say. He said, you know, if someone's making 10,000 pounds a year, this is the UK we're talking about, and they're tithing, they're giving 1,000 pounds, and they're living on 9,000 pounds. If someone's making 100,000 pounds a year, they're tithing 10,000 pounds, which is, a, you know, a, a 10 times more than the other one, but they're living on 90,000 pounds as opposed to nine thousand pounds. And that was the point that he was making. There's this huge difference in, in you know, what the person has the ability to do. And that point was, and he, he told me when he said this, he said he felt the Lord had shown him this. And I'm thinking, like, say, well, maybe I would have said not justice instead of injustice because of the fact that there's a different, you know, terminology between the two words. But I understand what he's saying. God gives us the ability to gain so that we can release even more. We keep our hands. Remember, if God can get it through us, he can get it to us. So I, I know where he's coming from with that. I'm just giving you that to chew on right now this morning because that's one that I've chewed on for years. Probably the first time I've mentioned it to you. But I've chewed on it for years because of the way that he presented it to me. And it was, it was just one of those things that I've, worked with. Okay. So anyway, this guy says, I've got mine. God said to him, foolish man, your soul will be demanded back from you this very night. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself or prepared? Okay. So um, God has something to say about his attitude of I've got mine. Pay attention. This is extremely important. First of all, he calls him a fool. Um, the word I, can be, it can be uh, softened a little bit. I did the same thing when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. 
Um, and because it can be presented as, as foolish man or foolish person. It doesn't have to be. In our culture, when we say fool, it's really harsh. And that's not necessarily the connotation of the word. It certainly could be, depending upon the context, but I'm giving it a little softer expression because of the fact that we don't need to automatically go nuclear level of you know, interpretation. So, foolish man. Now, the word foolish often has a moral aspect to it. It's not just that he doesn't quite think correctly or makes wrong choices. There's a moral issue when you say foolish one. And, of course, greed would be the moral issue. Because remember, the whole topic is about greed. This guy's got greed. He exemplifies greed. He's got enough. His barns are full, and he intends to tear down his barns now that, were, that already made him wealthy. Remember, the barns were the bank. What are our barns today? Our investment accounts. Our bank accounts. Our... CDs are, you know, whatever it is. Those are our barns. And so he's already wealthy with a certain amount of funds, and he's simply saying, I need, I'm going to tear down my barns, and I'm going to build bigger barns. I'm going to go through all that work and effort, toil, labor, spend all that money, so I can get to the end and say, I've got mine. He got his number, a gazillion. So the Lord says to him, foolish man, um, and the reason he was foolish is he ignored God's plan for his wealth. He didn't ask that key question. Why has God given this to me? You know, God gave this to me because he likes me better than everyone else. And he just wants me to enjoy life more than everyone else and spend lavishly on myself. Wrong answer. God certainly has given us wealth to enjoy. You live in the United States of America. You are among the wealthiest people in the world no matter how poor you think you are. Okay, I'm just, we have to be honest and real, you know, we have to be real about where we live. We consume the world's resources at a very high level because of the fact that we have so much good stuff. Right now, people that are in poverty can have um, things that people in poverty around the world would never think of having. When I was in the boonies of India, that's a specific province in India, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> No one. I mean, they had almost no electricity. I remember being in one village, and they had some electric lines coming in, and then the, the electric lines went to the leader of the village house, and there was one refrigerator. And it was hooked up. And by the way, the electricity went beyond all day, so they would know when the refrigerator was supposed to be shut, and like the medicines and stuff that need to be refrigerated would be in there. They didn't have those refrigerators so they could pop out a cold one. They had those refrigerators so that they would be able to refrigerate the stuff that absolutely needed to be refrigerated. You understand? We all got refrigerators in our culture for the most part. And if, we don't, if our refrigerators aren't working, we're thinking, oh my goodness, life is upside down. It's even worse if our air conditioners don't work. By the way, their heat index is way beyond ours. I was standing and preaching in 115 degree weather. They don't even... No one has air conditioning except there was, in a well-built house that I was staying in, there was one room that had an air conditioner in it that would only work when the electricity was on. And the electricity was off hours and hours each day. You understand? We are so wealthy. You know, televisions, they just didn't have them. You'd be going down the road and suddenly you'd see this little kiosk. And I mean, when I say little, I mean, here's one wall and here's the other wall. This is the kiosk. And it's deep enough to have a counter, and then there'd be a small television set up in the corner so they could watch the soccer games. Football. Right? So they, uh, I mean, you just, we are so spoiled. Okay? I mean, if someone doesn't have a television, goodness, if someone doesn't have a cell phone, well, they probably all had cell phones, but anyway. No, nah, they have a lot of cell phones out around the world now. But it's still not anything compared to what we have. So, um, we are incredibly wealthy people, which is why when we see something happening like Michael and we have the ability and God's leading us, we respond. Or when we see the Florence thing, and many of us responded for Florence. And, and, and so there's just different ways that we're able to respond to what's going on. Um, Jesus was, gave us 
In Matthew 6, God's plan for our wealth at a very high level, he said, Do not store up treasures on earth for yourself, where moth and insects consume it, and where thieves break in and steal. By the way, the word that's usually translated rust really is talking about insects. And, you know, when you talk about rust, you're talking about our culture, aren't you? Did they have rust back then? Yeah, but they didn't have as much stuff to rust like we do. Rust wasn't their big deal. It was insects consuming their stuff. That was a big deal. Moth and insects consume it and where thieves break in and steal. But, but store up treasures in heaven for yourself where neither moth nor insects consume it and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That was Jesus' teaching, where your treasure is. Make sure that if anyone looks at you who has any level of spiritual insight about your finances, that they can see that your heart is on the kingdom. That's what Jesus is saying. I remember years and years ago, listening to a uh, radio preacher, and he would, he would say, hey, whenever someone comes in and wants counseling in our ministry, we have a very simple request. Bring in your checkbook. That was back before everyone lived on debit cards and credit cards. Bring in your checkbook. And, the people, and, he said, and people would say, why do you want them to bring in their checkbook? Because I want to see where their heart is. All the counseling of the world, in the world is not going to do them any good if their heart's not on the kingdom. So I want to see where their heart is. And that is, a, you know, because you find out where their heart is by looking at their checkbook. Now, by the way, tithing helps us with checkbooks because of the fact that the Apostle Paul said when a part of the loaf is set apart as a tithe, it's holy, then the whole lump is holy. And so generally speaking, we can tell... If someone's tithing, that their heart is on the Lord, Jesus is actually going beyond. This rich guy, he, he tithed, you know that. Jesus is going, wait, this is, a, this is a Jewish person who tithed, there's no doubt. Or he would have been ostracized in his circles. Jesus is talking about something far beyond here, where our heart is. So, anyway, his point was, hey, anything that you have here can be affected by stocks that suddenly tumble during the past week. Did that happen this week? Yeah, again, okay. But store up treasures in heaven for yourself because if you, whatever you put into the kingdom, it's going to be waiting for you when you get there. So, foolish man, your soul will be demanded back from you this very night. Do you hear the word back in there? Demanded back. That really is the verb. Many of the translations do not bring in that idea of, it's, it's the word for paying off a loan. And that's life as a loan. Now, when he said soul, you could translate soul. When he said soul, you've got many things built up, do this, and, and then sit back, sow my soul and eat, drink, and be merry. And then the Lord says this day, your soul, your life, the word soul can be life. But it also is that life principle which is in us, which in, in, and, and the soul is the mind, the motions, the will. It's the part of us that lives on even when our bodies die. And so your soul is going to be demanded back from you. Each of us has our life on loan from God. That reminds us that this life is about serving God. Our life is on loan to God. And so we need to use it, recognizing that. So he said, tonight your soul will be demanded back from you. Then who's going to get what you prepared? And the, uh, this misstep on his part gave his heirs an early inheritance. That's really the bottom line. His whole dinner dialogue just made sure his heirs got their inheritance early. Do you know what this means? Um... If he had sown this treasure, it would have been waiting for him in heaven. But because he didn't sow it, he stepped into the presence of the Lord and he was bankrupt in heaven. Well, if he'd sowed anything before, but the point is he was greedy and so more than likely he has not done much. You say, well, he tithed. Yeah, tithe's giving back to God what is his. That's not sowing. That's not building up the treasures in heaven. That's just giving back to God the first fruit, what's already his. It doesn't build up the kingdom. So, his heirs got an early inheritance because he messed up. Then Jesus says this, and this verse is, yeah, I'll say it, the money verse. This is the 
bottom line for us. Jesus says, this same thing happens to anyone who stores up treasure for himself but is not financially generous toward God. Now, this whole parable would be really great fun if Jesus hadn't said verse 21, wouldn't it? You look at verse 21, you say, Lord, that's, oh, crumb, this same thing. You know what that means? This same thing. Jesus is saying, here's an eternal principle. When someone, and again, I'm not going to apply it to all the pagans. Because he was talking about people who say they're in covenant with God or are in covenant with God. He's saying, he's giving us a clue. He's giving us an insight so that we will understand how life works. You know how you don't always understand how life works? Right? I, I hope I'm not the only one. I have a lot of insight on life, but I, you know, I, I, I also know there's mysteries that I just simply don't understand. That I have to say that that's that person's story. Is I don't have the, you know, I don't know the, all the details and I just have to live in what I understand in faith. But Jesus says, this same thing happens to those who are in covenant with him. Um, And what this is saying is people die young because of this mistake. This landholder died young because of his greed instead of recognizing that there was something more he could do with his wealth. He was already wealthy. God wasn't going to kill him. It was only when he was tested with more wealth and he refused to use it appropriately that God said, well, tonight's your night. You want to know what the application is? No, you don't. Many wealthy Christians die young because they bought into a cultural mindset. I started with those videos, right? What's your number? I only need a gazillion. And I'm not telling us not to plan for the future. I'm not. Jesus would not. I mean, obviously, we need to be stewards of our finances. But at a certain point, if God has given us the gracious ability to live blessed, we need to be asking him when he gives us other things more. We have to say, hey, what is it? Jesus, what's it here for? Why are you giving me this resource? Why are you giving me this? Now, I'm talking to some people who know full well why God has given you that ability. You know your job. You know it's to, you know, obviously provide for yourself and provide for your family and tithe and to be able to look for areas where you can sow generously. You already know that. You're already givers. God gives the gift of giving. But there are people that just don't always get it. And the problem with that is they can have a tendency to die young this same thing it's only one greek word it's thusly which means this same thing people die young because of this mistake so how do you how do you get around this mistake well if you don't want to die young You'd be financially generous toward God. That's what he says. This is what the same thing will happen to anyone who treasures up for himself, but is not financially generous toward God. Now, that's as far as we're going today, but next week we're going to get into why. Because right now, what happens to people is, yeah, but this and this and this. And Jesus deals with all those things next in the thing. He, he starts meeting people's things that go off in their heads. Well, what about this or what about that? So this is part one today. Part two is next week when Jesus starts dealing with all the objections to what he is saying today. And so you just have to wait a week to be able to get to the objections. Now we've got the general principle. And he's simply saying, don't let the yeast of the Pharisees infect you. Don't let what's going on in that young man's life who's interrupting spiritually important discussion because he's worried about his inheritance. Don't let that infect you guys as he's talking to his disciples. And don't get infected with the spirit of this world to the level that you believe that God gives you everything you have for your own benefit rather than for the benefit of the kingdom, because that is a deadly mistake. And so it's one we got to chew on. I should have kept that video for right now, the gazillion one for right now. 
This one is not an easy message to digest in today's culture. I think, honestly, if I preach this in some churches, I would get run out of town. Stone. They would be looking for a cliff to throw me off of. And you know they would because there's so much distortion of this in many churches. However, I'm not the one teaching this. Who's teaching this? I'm just making applications of what he is clearly saying in these scriptures. And it's not just my translation. It's in your translations too. You understand? It's just nuances to open things up a little bit more. But the words are the same in each one of our translations. You can't get around to what he's saying. So... Uh, what happens if all of a sudden you sit and you're getting smacked in the face this morning and you're saying, my goodness, I haven't had that focus on God with my finances. Here's the good news. It's the gospel's the good news. Jesus forgives. I got confronted by something in a dream the other day, and yes, the Lord does confront me because I'm just like everyone else. I have feet that walk on the path every day, and there's attitudes and actions and things that we can stumble into. So in the middle, of, in a dream, I, and I knew it was the Lord. I mean, it was one of those vivid moments where I'm getting confronted over something. And you can wake up and you can think to yourself, oh no, this is a real problem. Or you can go, thank you, Jesus, for showing me this. I repent of it. I receive your forgiveness and I will change. And then you get up and go on with your life, not forgetting the change part. <laughs> That's how we deal with it. That's why Christ died on the cross for us, so that we could do that, so we don't have to labor under guilt, so we don't have to do any of that. So instead, we can say, you took my guilt, and now I will repent. I will agree with you that what you're saying is correct, and I will change my activity to come into line with what is better for me. That's what we do whenever we're confronted with something. So if you got smacked in the face by this today, just because you say, I haven't looked at my finances that way, well, start to and see what God does to your finances. Because if God can get it through you, he can get it to you. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this section of scripture, a section which can make us extremely uncomfortable. However, at the same time, it reminds us where life is released and where it is lost. I ask that on this day that you would give us the grace to be able to have any of our attitudes shifted that need to be shifted so that we can continue to grow in your kingdom and live long lives on the earth. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen.